Hello there, Lindsay here, the Frugal Crafter. Today we are going to paint a landscape for Watercolor Wednesday, and I wanted to do a landscape because I am releasing my new watercolor course. It's Watercolor Landscape Workshop, and it is seven and a half hours of brand new, never before seen landscape tutorials and training. So we're gonna start off here doing a landscape that um, I didn't put on the course, uh, but I really liked it. So I thought, oh, that'll be a good opportunity to do it here today. I'm making this kind of a mountainy, rocky, southwestern sort of um, cropping of rocks here. And I will link the reference photo below. So you can take a look at that. There's some really nice textures and some cactuses and some cool stuff like that. I didn't put it in the course though because um, I don't live in the Southwest, so I don't have as much um, much experience with painting that sort of scene, but I really liked it, so I thought it'd be fun here. Now in the foreground, I'm gonna put these, I think they're prickly pears. I'm not sure, they've got those big flat leaves like that. And I just, and I loved it because I just, I love foliage, I love flowers and plants, and I thought this would be really cool to, to have this in here. Oh, by the way, this video is being premiered on YouTube, which means if you're watching this at 5 p.m. on July 3rd, you can chat with me in the live chat area. If you're watching it after the fact, you can actually turn on the live chat and you can see what questions people have asked. That way, if you have any questions on the course, you can ask me, I'll be right there. And, um, and get a little more information that way. I also have a 50% off coupon code for you, so make sure you use that if you buy the class. And I will have the discount link right in the video description, so you can just click on that and the discount should show up. But I give the coupon code too, just in case. So we've got some of these oval um, uh, leaves or segments of cactus. Some of them are gonna be kind of tipped to the side, so you'd see a kind of a flatter shape. You see a little bit of the edge of the cactus. And then you've got some that are more kind of facing you and, and just more round. I want to get those in first so I don't accidentally draw over them or paint over them. Now they have these really pretty flowers on there that um, they're, well they almost look like roses at a distance, but they're kind of like an oval. And then they've got like a little opening at the top. So um, they kind of look like, uh, like if you watch a cartoon, if you have like cartoon roses, that's kind of how they look. Just kind of like very simplified, almost like a tulip shape, but without petals, just that kind of cylinder shape. But I just thought it was very, very graphic and stood out and was pretty. So I thought that'd be really fun to paint. Plus I really wanted to include it in the course, but it was already seven and a half hours long. So I didn't want to overwhelm anybody with too much, uh, too much content there. So go ahead and ask any questions you want about the course and I'd be happy to help you out with that. I don't need to, to paint every little thing. I just wanna make sure I have enough in there so that I'll be able to paint freely when I get to that point. And then we have this kind of other, um, I'm gonna exaggerate this a little bit. We have this other kind of like purpley mountain in the background, which I'm gonna extend a little bit more on my painting. And then we've got this kind of a hill and you've got these kind of rock formations. One of the landscapes in the course is uh, from Yosemite National Park. So we do get a little bit of that feel, but it definitely has more, um, has more of a, a woodsy, woodsy feeling to it. Okay, so that's all we really need for lines. Hopefully you can see that well enough to um, to follow along. In fact, I think I'll snap a photo of this and that way you can trace it if the drawing is a little difficult. We're gonna start off with a about a three quarter inch flat or a one inch flat, whatever you have for a big flat brush and wet the sky portion only. The paper I'm using is 100% cotton paper. This is the um, Arteza Expert Cotton Paper. You can use whatever brand you want. It doesn't matter, I just happen to have a pad of this sitting right next to me, so that's what I decided to use. Cotton paper just, um, you can use whatever paper you want. Cotton paper can be a little easier because it holds a more consistent level of water, so once you wet an area, you don't get the dry spots and the puddles as much as you do with a cellulose paper, but um, use whatever you're used to. You can definitely adapt and get used to whatever paper you have available to you. 
Okay, for the sky, I'm going to grab some ultramarine blue. And I'm going to add just a teeny bit of cadmium red to that, or pyrrole scarlet, whatever your warm red is. I want to gray it down, but I also want it to have a little bit of purple to it. Not a lot, but just a little bit. And add a little bit more water to that. Okay, we're going to add this at the top of our paper. I like to put all my pigment in here at the top. And then just kind of work it down. Bring it down to the mountains. And you're going to want a paper towel handy so that you can uh, you can blot. Now if you're new, it's always a good idea to watch the tutorial first and then you can uh, you can paint along it. That way you can anticipate what's going to happen next and it can make it a little bit easier. So I'm just grab my paper towel, I'm going to scrunch it up and I'm going to pull out a few clouds. Take a smaller piece here. Now generally your clouds are bigger up towards the top of the sky. We don't have a ton of sky here. That's because um, when you're, you're up over you, you're closer to those clouds that are up over you versus the clouds that are down near the horizon. And I'm kind of folding my towel and going in to get those flatter ones closer to the mountains. And I also want to put some shading in some of these clouds so it's not like a super bright day. I'm going to grab a number 12 round. I'm going to grab a little bit more paint. I'm going to grab the cad red or pyrrole scarlet, whatever your warm red is. And see how I made that kind of purpley, dull purple with the ultramarine blue and the warm red? I don't want it really bright. I just want it kind of, kind of dark there. Maybe a little more blue in there. And I'm just going to kind of go into the sky area and put in some clouds. Or more like the shadow on some of the clouds. Now I know it looks really harsh right now, but just you wait. We're going to tip it, grab a little spray bottle. A little 50 cent spray bottle here. You can help it kind of move a little bit. If you want to bring back some clouds, you can go back in with your towel. Also, make sure you don't have any puddles. The tape loves to collect puddles because the tape is not, is not absorbent. This is going to give us that kind of soft sky where you got just kind of that hazy overcast. Now I'm going to grab some blue on its own. This is a different sky than I show many skies in the in the course, but this is a different one. So again, I like to do things that's a little bit different so you can uh, get the most bang for your buck, get the most uh, the most bang for your time. It's so funny how skies can change. Sometimes you get a sky that's got that cerulean, almost green undertone, and then you'll have skies that will be more like purpley or more golden, depending on the time of day and the weather and the time of year. All that stuff comes with observation. Now, if you have a hard edge in your sky, you're not crazy about what you can do is clean the brush off, get some fresh water, blot it. You don't want your brush coat you completely, um, completely dry. And you just go around on the edge, and you can, and you can lift it up. And you can just kind of soften those edges. Either of my water is really dirty enough that I have to dip into the other one. If you feel like your sky has gotten too dark, what you can do, clean your brush off really well, 
And if you have cotton paper, it's a little bit more resilient than um, a wood pulp paper. You can actually go in and scrub some of the paint away. Now the colors that we used, which were ultramarine blue and cadmium red, or if you used ultramarine blue and burnt sienna, that's a real common color we use for skies because it kind of knocks down the blue a little bit. Those are sedimentary colors, which means you can go in and you can gently scrub and loosen that pigment from the surface. Since the pigment particles are larger, they don't go into the surface. So you can go and you can pull a little bit more out if you, if you have got too much in there. So I think the thing that a lot of people think in watercolor is that, well, I better get it right the first time because there's no do-overs. There absolutely are. I mean, it's definitely great if you get something in on the first wash because then it has such a loose, fun uh, feeling to it and it just looks so effortless. But that doesn't always happen. And some techniques and effects you want to get isn't going to happen in one layer. So, you know, don't worry about it and paint. You know, go back in and alter it if you need to. So the next part I want to work on is actually these plants in the front. Be careful that you don't drop water on your paper. That's, you'll notice that quite a bit if you do that on cellulose paper because it will just kind of like immediately push your pigment to the outside. I usually don't have my paint, my, my water buckets right there on like in front of my picture. I usually have them over to the side, but I want you to be able to see like if I'm dipping my brush and I'm scraping off water just so you can get a base of reference. So what I'm going to do is I am going to wet all of the green areas of my cactuses here. And if you wanted bigger cactus or you want more or less, you can make your landscape be what you want it to be. You don't have to have it just like mine. That's a great thing about learning how to draw and um, really observing what you see in nature is that you'll have that kind of um, built-in visual vocabulary in your brain so you can be like, hmm, I don't think I want that many cactuses or I think I'd rather have this sort of foliage that I know would be in the desert or I'd rather have um, this type of sky, you know, or I'd like to change my lighting to this type of day. And you can do that, but you have to practice and observe to get to the point where where you can uh, substitute confidently. And that's what I want my course to help you with. I mean, granted, nothing is going to take the place of practice, 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 but it helps if you're practicing the right stuff. Okay, there we got some color. Now let's drip in some gorgeous, we got some water. Now we can drip in some gorgeous color. I'm gonna start off with ultra with um, yellow ochre. I just like that color. I feel like it adds so much to, to everything. Now I'm going to grab some sap green. Now I'm not covering everything. I want to make sure that I can let it mix on the paper so I get a nice, vivid, uh, pretty, pretty effect. I feel like it's just, it's a lot fresher if your colors can mix on the paper a bit versus mixing everything out on your palette first, you can get a much fresher look. So going to grab a little bit of lemon yellow. So you can use lemon yellow, cadmium yellow light, Hansa yellow light, any sort of bright, cool yellow. Clean our brush in the dirty water, get fresh water from the clean side. And I am just going to go in and add it to my cactuses. I like to work with my paint dried out generally. You don't have to though, it's completely up to you. Um, I have a list of, I think it's about nine colors for the class and you're going to keep them out on your palette the whole time. So. You know, you can always use a plate if you don't have a, if you don't have a palette, you can, ceramic plates work fabulous, or if you don't typically use the colors that I suggest, which are pretty common colors, so chances are you have them already, um, you know, you could put them out 
and just, you know, work from them in a temporary palette if you're, you know, if you just want to have like a palette for that class. That's totally fine. Now, finally, I'm going to grab some Prussian Blue. Prussian Blue is, um, it's really nice because it's, it's a little bit earthier. Let me see if that, there we go. Haven't used this palette in a while, so. I have some Prussian Blue there. And I'm going to add this down here into the shadow areas. And I'm using the paint uh, pretty thick, almost like a paste. And that way I can kind of carve around some of these shapes, add some shadows, but also kind of help things fall in, like, it kind of helps make it feel like this is really dense and, and thick with foliage and just kind of verdant and and lovely and healthy. So if you don't have a ton of water on your brush, you can go in and you can keep some of the lines. You're going to have some bleeding, but I think that's fine. This is an expressive landscape here. So I'm painting around these because I just want to make sure there's some like shadow in there. Now I know I'm going to be using some burnt sienna. I know I'll be using some cad red or pyrrole scarlet, whichever warm red you like. And that will make gorgeous, this will make gorgeous darks so when I mix them with both the ultramarine blue and the uh, Prussian blue that I'm using here. So let me grab some of the Cad Red. Let's mix that right in there. Look at that gorgeous, just like eggplant color that we get. Those aren't colors you would use to make a purple typically because they're not going. They're they're further away from each other in the color wheel, but they are gorgeous for doing uh, doing shadows and neutralizing. Okay, now um, I think I will pull some of this color up. Because I want to add, I do want, I don't want to have this look like it's being cut out, you know what I mean? I like things to look like they're all part of the same scene, especially this area where I can see a little ground. So I'm just, I'm just going to bring that up and bring my water over much further than I know I'm going to bring color. So I'm just going to pull that out. So if it blends out, it has a place to go. I'm going to grab some burnt sienna and throw that in there. I've actually got warm weather, so you probably can hear airplanes. I have the, the, uh, the door of my office open because it's so nice out. It's been so cold. Okay. And we're going to throw in some of that mixed purpley color in there. But again, I'm letting that color mix in with the burnt sienna right on the paper. All right, I don't think I really need to go further than that. Oops, I just cleaned my brush in the clean water. Luckily, it wasn't that dirty. I'll just fade it out a little bit. But everything else is fine because um, because there was defined edges here where we had that kind of opening, where we had um, that kind of like opening in the ground where we had just kind of one little cactus on its own. I wanted to do something to integrate them. All right, I'm also going to put the red flowers on. I'm going to use some, I'm going to use some like permanent rose or quinacridone rose, any sort of cool red. You could use an alizarin crimson. Oh, isn't that pretty? Okay, so we're just going to throw those flowers in. We can let them bleed into the other shapes. I think that's pretty. This is a little bit looser than the um, real time tutorials in my course, just to let you know. Uh, 
just so you have the proper expectations. I think I want this one to have a little flower on it too. I love the way those blend in together. I think that's so pretty. Oh, maybe put some over here too. I just love that blending. It's such a pretty look. There. I want them all to have little flowers. Oh, you know what? I want one right here. Let your... Um, Partially go by the reference photo and partially just let your imagination do its thing too. That's I think gives you the best results when you um I like to have it's like I like to have a reference photo to give me kind of like a starting point, but then I like to do my own thing. Now obviously these are cactuses, so we're gonna have some um some thorns on them, and you can do that right here with your credit card scraper. You don't have to put every thorn in there. If you uh, time it just right when your paper is just starting to dry, you can get those really scraped out light thorns. But you know what? You can always go back in with a white paint pen or a white gel pen and you can get those in like really precisely later. So, you know, you can add a few at the end if you want to. These kind of have like evenly spaced little, little, um, little thorns throughout. The nice thing about doing the credit card scraper, and, and you can add the pen to it, I'm not saying like you don't, you wouldn't use a pen at all, but the nice thing about this is you actually get a little physical texture on your paper. So in addition to the visual texture that you'll get with your paint, you get some physical texture in there too, which is really nice. So when I'm checking if something is dry on my paper, what I'll do is I'll use the back of my hand, because the back of my hand is really sensitive, and, I, and it, it shouldn't disturb anything because it's never like, you know, your your palms can get kind of sweaty. Back of your hand is never going to get sweaty. So just gently lay it down on your paper. You just gently touch it. If it feels cool, it's not dry yet. But if it feels room temperature, then it's it's fine to go and paint next uh, next to it. It feels uh, just a tiny, teeny bit cooler than the, um, than the dry paper next to it. I think that's probably good enough because... Um, if it is a little fuzzy at the edges, that will push that mountain range back and it will actually be just what I want. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to take this color here. I'm going to add a little bit. Now remember, that was Prussian Blue and your warm red, either Cad Red or Pyrrole Scarlet. I'm adding a little bit of my um, Ultramarine to it. And ooh, this brush is a little big for that, so I'm going to go in with my round. I am going to just fill in that, those mountains that are further away with that. And I'm just going on dry paper because I don't have very much space here that I need to cover. So I don't really have to worry about streakiness and it's all one flat color so it's pretty easy just to fill in. Make sure it's cool enough. I don't want it to come forward. Adding these layers and having the layers cooler as you go back that gives you some more depth because um, warmer colors come forward, they advance, and cooler colors recede. And also the colors for the way appear to be more muted and just kind of faded. There we go. Especially when you don't have a super, super bright sunny day. You see all the clouds we have in the sky, we know this isn't going to be a super, super bright sunny day. And when you don't have a super, super bright sunny day, how many times can I say super? When it's not super bright, you get more um, you get more haziness when you have like like no clouds in the sky, bright blue sky. Like think of the autumn, how crisp and bright it is in the autumn. Everything can almost look in focus and clear and crisp and almost kind of flat because you have so much light. But when you have the light diffused with a lot of clouds, you get a lot more depth because um, you don't have so much light kind of blinding everything and closing up our irises and are closing up our pupils and making everything sharpen and focus. <clears throat> just like photography. So now we can start working on this range of mountains. By the time I'm down here, I think those are going to be dry enough, so I'm not going to fret about that. I'm going to go back to my flat brush and I'm going to grab some yellow ochre. I'm also going to grab some burnt sienna. <clears throat> you 
And I really liked that kind of purpley color we made, that dull purple, so I'm going to grab some more Cad Red. And I'm going to mix that with some Ultramarine, I think, because that's warmer. It'll come forward a little bit more. And I think we'll probably use some Cad Red on its own, or pretty much on its own. We got some, we got some uh, of that gray mix in there. A little more burnt sienna, I don't have much of that. All right, now what I plan on doing, because we can't see a ton of detail on those mountains way back there, is that I'm gonna kind of paint it, I just blotted my brush off. Um, I'm gonna kind of pick up colors and add colors as I go, kind of in a slap dash type of fashion. So I'm just gonna go in. I want the feeling of, of these kind of rocky, Rocky, rough mountains, deserty fountain, deserty rock fountain formations. I'm gonna try not to overlap the sky too much, but if it does, I'm not gonna worry about it. And I'm just kind of alternating my colors as I go. That's pretty. I like that. Oh, I just love it when my, my paint mixes on the paper for landscapes because I think it just gives it such a lovely freshness. A lot of people, um, when I was develop developing this class, I was thinking a lot about the questions that people ask me during live streams. And, and I might have a live stream on Friday. Um, I've got to see if I can figure out how to do it. They changed it on YouTube since the last time I did one, so I'll have to check and see if I can do it and see if Sarah's available, but um, uh, but keep an eye open. I might do one on Friday. Uh, but anyway, so like all the questions that I would get over the years, I kind of kept notes in my, when I because I've been planning this landscape course for a while, and I would keep notes because I knew that I wanted to address the things that people had a hard time with. Rocks was one of those things. We have a whole section on just different ways to do rocks because uh, I, I heard from so many people that it was such a kind of sticking point and they had such difficulty, and I want to make sure that I that I went over that. So, if you can, if you're if you're one of the the rock the people that want rocks, then then you will be rocking rocks by the end of that by the end of the course. I'm gonna grab some more yellow ochre. I haven't used that in a little bit. You can also tap in like little lines like that. It's so cool how you can see like all these different layers of um, of sediment in the rocks when they're like this. It's so cool. We have a lot of rocks like that um, around here in coastal Maine where they blasted through um, they blasted through like mountains to make our roads, especially like um, along the coast, along Route Three on the coast. And it's I always think it's just so cool looking because you just see all those layers. It's like you see what, you know, the earth took millions of years to form and it's right there and you're driving by it. I just think it's so cool. I'm working wet on dry, but this is pretty wet paint. I don't know if you can see the sedimentation of those colors, how they're kind of like um, sedimenting out. You need quite a bit of water for that to happen and you need quite a bit of pigment, but that texture is just, uh, is just wonderful. And we'll be able to do a little scraping and squishing in there too to give us a little bit more texture. We don't want to like make it crazy detailed because we this is still further in the background and we want to keep it there. Let's see, we dry there. Yeah, we're dry enough, I think. Um, but it's you know you want to you got to have something you can work into if you're going to do scraping. Your big brush. Get used to your big brushes. That is, you will you will improve your painting skills by using a, the biggest brush you can handle in an area, and, and it will also save you a lot of time. And what it also saves you is the fussing. You're not going to fuss around in so many little details when you're using a big brush. And it's, I think it's when you get you start fussing in one little area, and then you completely go blind to everything else that's happening in your picture, and then and that's how paintings can go awry because you get one area looking the way you think you want it and then you realize it's not jiving with everything else that you have going.
So everything is still wet here in the mountains, and that's just what I want. When you can keep everything to the same level of wetness on your paper, you can avoid getting the blossoms and blooms and you can keep going in and working in an area. So having a paper that's got a good amount of sizing, uh, cotton paper, if you, if you have it available to you, those things will really help. All right, I, and you can leave it just like this and have it kind of just like kind of like modeled and morphed in the background like that, but I do want to get a little bit of texture. I do want to have a little bit of that nice rocky uh, rocky feeling to it. And I have a couple of cut up pieces of credit card here because I like to have different widths to scrape with. I saved my old gift cards. I actually have this whole um, it's like a whole baggie in my one of my drawers in my studio downstairs and it's just uh, just credit cards, like old cut up credit cards. And I've got one in my teaching stash that I bring with me when I'm teaching because it's, you know, I give them, I'll give them out. They're just the best, the best tools. See, you can just kind of scrape and squeegee the paint around. Don't try to make it perfect. Don't try to be like, okay, I'm trying to paint that exact third bump on the left exactly the way it looks. You don't want to do that. You want to make it random. Like nature is random. Such a fun texture. Something I noticed that if you use the edge of a credit card that's rounded, if you have that piece, that piece you can often like scrape out highlights a little bit better than the sharper edges. So keep that in mind if you are trying to like um, make like a tree branch or something that's farther away, you can get those those shapes a little bit better. Okay, so I've got a bunch of different shapes in here. Now I am going to go in with, uh, I think I'll go in with my round brush. Now going in with a round brush, we want to do that same pasty technique that we did down here. And I am going to go in, I'm going to take some ultramarine blue, I'm going to take some Prussian blue, I'm going to take some of the warm red, and a little bit of burnt sienna. And then I do want some of this that's a little bit darker, so I'm going to grab a little bit more ultramarine. All right. And so I'm going to look through and, and see where are the darkest areas. This is one of the darkest areas here, so I want to go in and add some of that in there. And it will stay pretty much where you put it, and any place you have one of those carved in ridges, it's going to like suck into those, um, those scrapes that you put in there, and it's really going to give you a uh, realistic dark area and I really want to darken this behind this ridge here because that's gonna like almost feel like you've got a canyon. You've definitely got a drop off there and I want to give you that kind of like sense of drama and uh, depth. We do have it a little bit lighter as we go up, probably because it's getting a little bit more light from the sun. So maybe I'll grab that one that's a little bit more brown for when I'm getting up, up in here. And any of the shapes that you see, like that have been made by the way your paint settled and dry, started to dry, or the way the scrapings went, you can um, I'm going to bring this over. I don't want it like going off the corner exactly of the page. I'm bringing it over a little bit. Um, so you can go ahead and uh, intensify those. You can let the scrapes that you've painted in there be the formations of the rock. Any color we've used is fair game. Try not to get fussy. Try to keep it pretty loose back here. And 
And remember, you can pause whenever you want to. You can come back and finish it whenever you like. Now my courses um, are a little different than the YouTube videos. They are broken up into segments, so you don't have like one video that's an hour long. You have, you would have like four 15 minute videos or uh, four 20 minute long videos. So it would make a little bit more of a of a natural place to take a break. So obviously that's not really available to do on YouTube unless I make different videos. And then I always find whenever I've done that that the um, the subsequent videos don't get watched. So so that's why I don't do that here and it would make I think it would just really clutter things up. I'm adding a little bit of blue, just ultramarine blue, kind of watery, loosen a few of the parts just to kind of make sure it recedes. So that's another another bonus to, to having the class. It's just broken down into kind of snackable chunks a little bit better so that you know you can take breaks a little bit more easily and it'll keep your place I mean YouTube keeps your place too it's all good it's just a different option okay oh I'm really happy with that so that's going to shift a little bit lighter when it dries because we did have it in there pretty wet um, just like anything with watercolor and the next thing I'm going to move on to is let's see that's still a little damp I think think that I'm going to let this dry and then we'll come back and paint in this section right here. Alright, I'm back. I had a nice cup of tea and now my paper is dry and I am excited to proceed. So we're going to start with this area up here and we're going to do that same technique where I told you about how we put the wash in and then we do the pasty, the pasty paint layer. I'm going to take some yellow ochre and I'm going to grab some burnt sienna, mix those together. And I am going to fill in this area here, and I'm, I'm wet on dry because I've got plenty of moisture in this paint to do what i got to do. So basically, I will wet the paper if I need an area to stay uniformly wet for longer than what I could do if I just went wet on dry. Uh, or if I need to, a large area to blend, or I, you know, I want to like cover a full background. You can choose um, to wet uh, an entire area, put... put paint in, like if I wet this whole area and then I added my paint, it would only go as far as I wet it. So it's a great way to keep things in control. But sometimes what happens when you wet an area, then you go in with pigment, your pigment gets a little diluted and I, I didn't want that to happen. I'm gonna grab a little more burnt sienna and grab a little bit of my warm red, my cad red or pyrrole scarlet, whatever you happen to be using. I'm just gonna dab a little bit of that in there. You get this beautiful, like iron, um, irony, color to the rocks. It probably is like an iron oxide. And that's what your burnt sienna is made out of. Most of, your, most of your browns are a form of iron oxide, so you actually are getting that color in there, which is super nice. Okay, and I think I would like to have a little bit of a cooler yellow in there. It's a little bit brighter. So I'm going to grab a little bit of Hans Yellow Light or Lemon Yellow, whichever you're using, and I'm just going to dab it in some areas in here and let it mix on the paper. <clears throat> Excuse me. Okay, so that's my base. And now what I'm going to do is clean my brush off. And I'm going to wipe it. So I do not want to have excess water. It's a little damp. It's going to have a little water on there. I won't be able to pick up my paint. Okay, so see how my paint is just like, almost like a paste. Like consistency. So now what I'm going to do is I am going to just kind of dab. These are going to be like bushes that are just kind of clinging onto the edge of the edge of the rock face here, edge of the mountain. And they like to stay put when you have that pasty paint. Just kind of dab them in. If you had a blunt round, that would work well too. This is a pointy round. You can kind of see how sharp and pointy that brush is. If you had a blunt round, it would give you, uh, it would work even better. So that's why I don't toss out my old brushes, because they're often really handy for texture and stuff like that. A little bit more dense over here. I'm going to grab a little bit of Prussian blue. I don't want to add any water, because... I want to keep it pasty. 
And if your paint your paint's dry in your palette, you're only going to leave a little residue on the top of the paint. You can wipe that off easily with a damp brush when you're done painting. So don't worry about contaminating as long as your paint's dry. And I'm going to add some of this darker greeny blue. Or I should say bluish green. Here and there as well. Now in the reference photo, there was kind of like a scruffy uh, tree here. I don't think I'll be putting that in, but I probably will put some of the like the, the shrubs in that area. Because I'm afraid if I do some big tree in there, it's going to detract from my cactuses that I put there. Okay. Now I'm going to come down to this area here and I am going to just wet this area and I'm wetting it because I've got all these areas to get around with these cactuses so um, I know it's just going to take me a little bit longer to get, oops I dropped some water, to get around everything so by wetting this section which is a little big it'll just give me that um, that time I need. I don't know if you can hear the wind blowing outside. That's so nice. And I do have a trick for sharpening up these cactuses and making them a little bit more pronounced when we're finishing up. So I'm not going to be too worried about painting around them. I'm not going to be too worried if I overlap them a little bit. I'm going to try not to have a halo of white around them. And I don't have to go around this one too much because I already have that dark in there. Okay, I'm going to start off with my yellow ochre. I love yellow ochre. It's such a pretty color. It seems to make everything look a little bit nicer. And I'm going to grab some burnt sienna. And add a little bit. I'm actually going to add some of the red that we used for the flowers into that, which was this one right here. Like a permanent rose type of color. Add some of that in there. I'm going to make some gray, some gray down color. I'm going to take some burnt sienna and some ultramarine blue. I'm going to scrape off the extra water back into my jar and grab that blue. some of it around these flowers on the ground this and I'm letting it blend because I needed that time to be able to blend things together I wet it first so it's just giving me a little bit extra open time to work so I'm not rushing so think about that when you're trying to decide should I wet my paper should I let it be think about how much time it's going to take you to, to finish an area, whether you want to blend or not. And that will help you decide what you want to do. I usually don't wet right up to an object. I'll wet, I'll, um, I'll wet pretty close to it, but not right up to it. And then I'll go in with my brush with a color and I'll go right around the object pretty closely. And then I'll let it kind of bleed out into the water and I just find it helps me from getting puddles right up next to an object and awkward hard edges. I also think that I want to do a little bit of, um, I'm just going to mix up some some neutral here just by grabbing some of the colors I have. I want to add some of that up here because I want to add some shrubs, but I don't want to have just plain white paper behind them. I want to have something behind them. So 
I'm going to throw in some of this just kind of neutral mix back here so that I'll be able to put some shrubs. Okay, so for the shrubs, I want to have just come in some bright, uh, some bright pops of color. Before I do that though, I'm going to actually take some of that cad red, some of that burnt sienna, and then we'll throw in just some of the little striations I see in the rocks. And I'm doing that with a pasty paint. I like this because it's a different pattern than what we've been working on, so it's a little more, it's just something different for interest. So I'm getting those pad, that pattern in there. And it doesn't need to be real detailed because it's far away. And I can also take that and add it to this area as well. Maybe not as much stripey as it, like a chunk or two of that color. Okay, so now let's get those, um, those bushes painted. I'm going to start off with some sap green. I'm just going to start flicking up some color. I want this darker value than my cactus. Just because it's a desert doesn't mean everything has to be all, all sandy and uh, all sandy and dry. I want to vary the levels where they start. And look, we can redefine our edges a little bit. Okay, yeah, the little ridge of these. Pasty paint, and it will hold its shape. Put some up here. Now generally things closer to you will appear a little bit bigger. So we can go a little bit bigger with these guys. Because they are starting further down on the paper. You can fill in as many as you want. Alright, I'm going to grab some of the lemon or Hansi Yellow Light, whatever you're using for a cool yellow. And I'm pretty much just going to pick that real pasty on my brush and I'm going to go into the tops of these bushes. and add it right in there. Gives it that sun-kissed look as well. Think about yellow though. That is one that you do want to clean your brush before you dip into because it, it is harder to get a color out of yellow than it is to like pull a color out of brown or red or blue because yellow is so light in value. Although yellow does tend to be one of the more opaque colors, which seems kind of counterintuitive because we think of it as so kind of pale and um, weak, it really isn't. Yellows do tend to be a little bit more opaque because they tend to sit on the top of the, of the paper a lot of the time. I'm going to grab some Prussian blue. Real pasty. Add some of that in the shadow areas towards the bottom of these bushes. Oops. I'm 
you can carve out shapes a little bit with them as well. You might get some rough edges um, where the bottoms of the shrub meets the ground, but I think that's alright because, you know, they would be rough. Those edges would be rough. Let's extend some of those branches up a little bit higher too, especially this one that's close to the New York, so that one would appear taller. Do that with a Prussian blue first because we can really we can really make him show up there. So that way instead of having that big tree, you have kind of a big shrub there. So we're altering the reference photo a little bit. I think that's I think it's good to do that because then you can make your landscape look the way you want it to. Go back in with the Hansa Yellow Light at the edges of those branches. And there's that. Okay, so now we have our cactuses that need a little more detail because they are the focal points there in the front. And I'm going to start going through and bringing out some of their shape a little bit more. And something I didn't do in the online class was use white gouache, but, well that's black gouache, we don't want that. Uh, um, but for this particular lesson, here on YouTube, I am going to use some white because it's going to be a great way to capture the um, the quality of that cactus, and it's going to be a little bit of time saving, which is really good for YouTube because um, you know longer videos don't do as well on YouTube, and this one's going to is, is pretty long already. So I took some Prussian blue and the green that was left over on my brush, and mixed it in with some white gouache, and got a little of that Hansi yellow light in there. And I am going to start reclaiming my edges. And plus I can get that nice uh, kind of sea foamy color. I can use the texture of the paper, just kind of dragging my brush along the side to grab that texture and give the appearance of the kind of thorniness. Now another way you could do this, if you had a little bit more time, you could scrub out the lights and then go back in and glaze. That would be a way to do it. The only thing to, th to remember when you're doing this is that when you do your white or your opaque color, you want that to be your final layer generally because Anything you put over that could make it kind of muddy. And I don't wouldn't recommend covering everything up because you want um, you want some of that the colors and stuff to shine through from before. Like I really like how that red looks blending in, so I don't want to cover that up. I really like that. So I just want to kind of get some of the edges that are just disappearing. Opaque colors do not flow as much, so you could even work against one of the damp edges, and it it shouldn't uh, it shouldn't really make the paint flow. And you may want to switch to a stiffer brush. I generally like uh, to use a golden tackle on acrylic painting brush when I'm using gouache because I just find it pushes the paint a little bit better. So I'm gonna grab a couple of those. It's really neat on these cactuses how some look very, um, almost like a really pale, like kind of tealy aqua color, and then some look more yellow. That one has a lot of yellow ochre in it, so I think I'm going to go and bring some of that yellow ochre in the mix.
And if you add water, you can get it so it's not quite so opaque. So you can get just the uh, level of, of opacity and color that you want. Color pencil is also fun to add. Now the, the course, as I mentioned again, is strictly water. It's transparent watercolor. There's no color pencil or, or mixed media. So the supplies are very limited, which is nice, especially if you're just getting started and you want to just use basic watercolor supplies. Okay, I'm going to let that sit for a bit, and I am going to grab a white paint pen, and I'm going to use a Posca pen. And actually, I think I will put on little dabs of Brent Sienna where I plan on putting the um, Brent Sienna, a little bit of ultramarine blue, where I plan on putting the um, quills because I noticed that there's like a little dark spot where they come out of. So I'm just, I, I try to use an economy of brush strokes, you know, try to, try to do, do a lot with a few, a few strokes so it doesn't get too overworked. You don't want your watercolors overworked. That's probably the, sh the easiest way to ruin a watercolor is overworking it. That's like I mean, like that spot right there. I just love that where the where the paint bleeds together. Probably somebody from the Southwest would see this and be like, she's obviously never been to the Southwest. Just like when I see somebody paint a lighthouse who's not from the coast, you could say, oh yeah, they've, they've probably never seen a lighthouse. It's so funny, just those little things that you would never like notice unless you are from uh, wherever that type of thing was common. So I'm just putting a cup one, between one and three little um, barbs off of the off of the dots, if that, honestly, because you wouldn't see every little, every little, um, every little detail. So you really want to edit when you're doing something like this. Especially, on the, I think it looks really good when you have it going over the edge. Now, of course, you could also do this with masking fluid beforehand if you wanted to, like with a masking pen or a really fine brush and masking fluid or a toothpick and masking fluid. And then you would just rub off the masking fluid after you were completely done the painting. I don't tend to use masking fluid very much. I find it, for me, I, there's nothing wrong with it, but I find it to be a little fussy, so unless I absolutely feel like I have to, like there's something that is just too delicate to paint around, or if I'm trying to be extremely precise, I generally will pass on the masking fluid. You can also use this pen to add any defining highlights that you want. All right, I'm gonna let this dry and then we'll come back for final details. Okay, I have let this dry. I'm gonna go in with some Prussian blue and some sap green. And I'm gonna add a little bit of shadow around some of these at the bottom here. And 
Now I'm going wet on dry. There's just some places where I feel like it needs a more distinct shadow, so I'm not going over any of the whiter, the areas where we add white. I'm going next to those areas, and then I'm just kind of fading in that color. Just to give it a little bit more, a little bit more depth. And I'm going to bring in just a little bit, scumbling it, kind of working on the side of my brush, bringing in some of that, starting on the tape and just dragging it up. If you're on a block, just start from the edge of your block and just drag it up. I need to get that texture from the paper. Oh, I like how the colors are going there, so I don't want to mess that up. I don't want to, I don't want to get in everywhere. I just kind of picking and choosing where I want to have a little bit of shadow or definition. I like I can go over the white pen. It still stays pretty. It kind of resists the uh, watercolor a little bit, so I don't have to worry about that quite so much. Okay, of course you see the big reveal when the tape goes away and you see all, you get all that messy stuff. It looks so much prettier. Uh, I'm always, I always look forward to seeing the tape be removed. Okay, so now I want to do a little bit to those flowers. I think I do want a smaller brush for that. Uh, I'll grab this one over here. I'm going to grab, just grab that, um, that pinky right on its own. I'll just get some clean water in there. Uh, we'll see how that does on its own. I might need to add a little bit of, I'll probably add a little bit of Prussian blue to that in some areas. First I'm going to pump up the color on some of these. does not hold a tremendous amount of paint. Ooh, you know what we could do actually, since we have that gouache out, why don't we take a little bit of that white gouache and mix it in there. Then we could do, we do some of the, uh, the round parts on the top of that. Ooh, that's pretty, I like that. Probably just do it with just the uh, with just the white. Make that little oval of where the opening of the flower is. I'm not crazy about this brush. I think I've I think it's uh, about done for detail. A little bit worn down. Most of the light seems to be at the tops of everything, so... It's, I mean, it's pretty overhead light. I like to get the edges because it makes it stand out from the background a little bit. You can also go back in with some of that white mixed in with your greens and Prussian blues if you feel like anything else needs a little bit of a a pumping up or breaking from the background a little bit. Sometimes you just need to get that little bit of extra contrast. And going kind of dry brush like that gives you a little bit of that thorny texture too. Alright, for shadows on the flowers, I'm going to do 
Prussian blue. And that red. Make a nice purple there. It just gives you a little bit more uh, definition. I've got to get a different brushes. Brushes driving me bananas. But where my little Mimic Squirrel one went, hmm, I just had it yesterday. This one. Oh, let's use this one. This one's pretty good. This is a Da Vinci Nova. This one holds much more paint. All right, now let's see. Well, it's really dark. We can get some real good uh, definitive shadows here. If you want to do any other things to this, you could bring in some colored pencil if you wanted to, like if you wanted to brighten anything up. Um, you can kind of scumble on the edge and you can bring in a little bit more color, especially you can go over that white. You can go over the white because this is transparent and won't mix in with the gouache. So if you thought your white looked too hazy, you could go in with a little colored pencil. Again, we're not using color pencil or gouache or pen in the course, but for uh, just brightening up this, we'll do that today right here. The color pencil goes really well over gouache because of the um, because of the rough texture the gouache can leave behind. Some of that sea foamy green in there that's real pretty. And of course, you could do some shadows in there. I don't know if my shadows are dry yet, but you could do that um, as well. And if you have any issues with your kind of shrubs not standing up, I need a more opaque yellow. Let's try this one. You could go in, well, that's not very opaque. You can go in and brighten them up a little bit on the edges. That feels still like it might be a little damp up there. No, but if you need a little texture, ooh, that's pretty, that really shows up there for some reason. And that does seem to be wet there. It really looks nice when you have that yellow right over the purple, I think, because it's their opposites. And when you can break one of the, um, one of the planes with something else, I feel like that is a really effective tool. Having some spiky textures next to the round textures is nice. And I'm just scribbling here. I'm just having fun just uh, finishing up fairly quickly. And for texture you can also scumble in with the color pencil on the uh, foreground here. Get a little bit of a sandy dirt texture. And just a little bit of maybe indigo or something. Ooh, I like that. It's pretty. It's fun to throw some mixed media at a painting. Especially if you have things you're trying to layer up and it's um, something that wouldn't necessarily be as conducive to a one layer watercolor or to a, um, uh, you know, without a lot of troublesome masking or anything. When you want to paint kind of uh, direct, that's, the, that's what I'm going for, when you want to do some direct painting. And then just bringing this in from the bottom and the edge like this, it gives you a little bit of a frame. Which I think is kind of nice. 
You can throw a little bit of that in there too if you want. Indigo Blue is one of my favorite colored pencil colors. I use it a lot for shadows. That and Tuscan Red, I'll mix them together. Okay, let's take away the tape and see what we have. That's always the fun part. Love the crisp white borders. And I always pull my tape back on itself like that and it's less likely to tear. You can also heat it up with a heat tool or a hair dryer. The heat loosens the adhesive. I get the cheap tape at Dollar Tree because it's not that sticky. It works really good for painter's tape or for, um, for taping off your watercolor paper. And there's that. I think that looks really, really nice. Let's zoom out. There we go. And um, really, wasn't that tricky to do? We have a lot of depth. It was fun. We used some mixed media techniques. And I hope it inspires you to grab your supplies and make some art. So if you are interested in my new online landscape class, just keep in mind it's not mixed media. It's straight transparent watercolor. Um, you can find out more information in the video description along with a 50% off launch special. So I give all my friends and followers and subscribers 50% uh, off if they buy my class the first month when I release it. I just released it today, so um, you get to save 50% and check it out in the video description. I thank you so much for watching, and um, if you hang on a second, I will show you the, the finished tutorials that we'll do in the class so that you can get a little bit more information on that, and uh, I'll go grab those right now. So I do apologize if this sounds like one big sales pitch because it kind of was, but I just want to make sure that everybody that was interested that's been asking me about it can find the information. This is um, one of the tutorials that we do. Now these are longer tutorials than I usually do on YouTube, so they are going to take some time. So I just want to put that out, but they are broken up into like four sections, three or four sec sections each, so you can take breaks really easily. I really liked how the reflections came out there. That was a lot of fun. Um, we've got this one here, this tropical scene, which is was also a lot of fun to paint. Um, showed you how to deal with accidents, deal with splatters that happen when you don't want them to happen, and blending and layering and all that jazz. And we have got, oops, an upside down painting there. We have got reflections, doing reflections in water, painting clear blue days, um, getting like snow-capped mountains, that sort of thing. So I try to have the long tutorials be very, um, uh, kind of cover different aspects so that you could learn the most about landscapes. And of course, there are standalone lessons for trees, different types of deciduous trees, different types of conifers, different ways to do rocks, so that if you're confused by how to get rocks looking like rocks, uh, which seems to be the number one problem people have, uh, I'll go over that as well. So I hope you join me for class. There is a 30-day money-back guarantee on my classes, so um, you don't have to worry about not liking it or it not doing what it promises to do, which is teach how to plant landscapes. Well, again, thank you so much for watching. Please give me a thumbs up before you go. If you have any questions, let me know down below in the comments or in the chat if you're watching live. And until next time, happy crafting.